Lord, open my lips. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. Preserve me, O God. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You, oh my God. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also will secure. Or you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You make me known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and your right hand are pleasures
A reading from Isaiah, the 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on the mountain the covering that has cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. O Lord, have mercy on us. A reading from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I, was, I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God was, that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so we believe. O Lord, have mercy on us.
Please rise for our third reading. From the Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. O Lord, have mercy on us. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. Oh. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is from our third reading, the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20, verse 8. He saw and believed. Here ends the text. Have you ever had an aha moment? You know what I mean. It's a moment of sudden realization, inspiration, perhaps insight, recognition, or comprehension. It's that moment of clarity where everything falls into place and you understand. Science is filled by, perhaps you could say even driven by, the aha moments. Perhaps the most well-known is Archimedes, who discovered the principles underlying buoyancy, principles that have allowed us to build and deploy boats and ships from rickety rafts all the way up to large aircraft carriers. The story goes, whether true or not, that upon figuring it out, Archimedes leapt out of his bath, ran down the street, shouting, Eureka, I have it. But even our own lives, we occasionally experience such flashes of clarity, these aha moments. Like when we find that one piece of information that helps us solve a difficult problem. Or like when we hear, surprise, and then understand all of the guarded whispers, the furtive glances, the awkward conversations, the nervous smiles. Or like when we finally come to that great epiphany in life, realizing that our parents are probably a whole lot smarter than we believed. Consider our gospel lesson. It's Sunday. It's the third day after their master's tragic death and burial. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom we know as the Apostle John, are running to the tomb. They were anxious and concerned. Why? They had just received word from Mary Magdalene that the tomb was open and the body was gone. They arrived at the tomb, John first, then Peter. They entered the tomb, Peter first, then John, and saw the burial clothes lying there. After recounting all of this, the Apostle John makes this confession about himself. He saw and believed. Aha. Human reason would conclude, as Mary Magdalene did, that someone had simply taken the body. The response should be grief and anger and agitation, not belief. Furthermore, in the Jewish religion, the resurrection of the dead, if it occurred at all, was a future event. Bodies stayed in the grave until the last day. Thus, a resurrection was not something that would occur in the present time. For our Lord's disciples had yet to understand from Scripture that he must rise from the dead. In order for us to understand John's aha moment, we need to go back about three years to the beginning of our Lord's ministry. We read in the second chapter of John's Gospel that after Jesus drove the animals and the money changers out of the temple, the Jews confronted him and demanded a sign. Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, of course, Jesus was speaking of his body. Now listen to what John continues to write. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The empty tomb shines its light upon our Lord's words and deed, giving John clarity, perspective, and understanding. He saw and believed. For those of us blessed to see the empty tomb through the eyes of John, that is, through the eyes of Holy Scripture, 
Jesus' resurrection puts everything about our faith into proper perspective. It helps us understand the power and wisdom that God reveals in the cross. As St. Paul explains, for Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Without the resurrection, Paul's words are meaningless. Our Lord's rising from the dead validates for us his work on the cross. It is God's great exclamation point that Jesus is indeed the Savior of all mankind, that he is God in human flesh, the very Son of God, our Savior. The resurrection comforts and reassures us that our faith in Christ is not in vain. Human wisdom and reason alone cannot fathom the cross. Viewed by itself, the cross seems weak and foolish, and indeed it is foolish to those who are dying. The cross appears to be such a terrible, brutal way for God to save mankind. As a symbol of victory, the cross seems woefully out of place. Thus the unbeliever scoffs at what he views as a weak, foolish, cruel, and unnecessary death. However, when we view the cross in the light of the empty tomb, that is, in the light of the resurrection, we gain a new and correct perspective. God reveals his strength through weakness, his wisdom through foolishness, his love through suffering, his victory through defeat. The resurrection reveals the cross for what it accomplished, the defeat of sin, death, and the power of the devil. Christ's resurrection, that great aha moment, alters our relationship with death, especially our death. All who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. We are buried with him. And as Christ is risen from the dead, never to die again, so also all who look upon the Son and believe in Him shall rise on the last day unto eternal life. His empty tomb is a sign for us that our tombs, our graves, shall be empty as well. Death and the grave have no power over us. For on the last day, these two great enemies must yield up their captives, yield up us, to the one who has conquered them. Christ's resurrection also shapes our Christian faith and life. Indeed, it would be foolish to believe in Jesus if he did not rise from the dead. The Apostle Paul puts it so clearly, so eloquently, if Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain, and we are the most miserable of people. There would simply be no reason then to pay attention to our Lord, especially when he says, deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. Without Jesus rising from the dead, our salvation would be at best uncertain, at worst a delusion. There would simply be no purpose for us to believe in Jesus the sacraments that we hold so dear would become empty, meaningless symbols. Why be buried with Christ unless he has risen? Why celebrate the death of, in the Lord's Supper unless he is alive, never to die again? The resurrection of Jesus helps us understand the life-giving power in baptism, the life-sustaining power in the Lord's Supper. Our Lord's resurrection gives us that certainty that the forgiveness of sins Christ earned on the cross is ours by faith in Him, imparted to us 
through word, through sacrament. The aha moment of Christ's resurrection is a continual presence in our hearts and lives. It is, as Paul proclaims, not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Certainly sin continues its presence in our lives, and it shall do so until the last day. The empty tomb keeps our faith steadily focused on and firmly grounded on the cross of Christ a foundation that can withstand all the assaults of the devil, the world, and even our sinful flesh. How can this be? Through daily contrition and repentance, we drown and bury that old sinful man in Christ's tomb so that the new man may arise in us from that tomb to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Thus, in living out this aha moment, our suffering and crosses become easier for us to bear. Our neighbors become easier to love and serve. For the new man is born of Christ, loving God and our neighbor as Christ does. John saw the empty tomb and believed. His aha moment. We too see the empty tomb, not with physical eyes, but through the eyes of God's word, through the eyes of John. The empty tomb remains an aha moment for us. It shines its clarifying light upon Christ and his cross, revealing for us God's great act of redemption, sending his only begotten son to suffer die and rise again so that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aha. Amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. We rise and sing the canticle.
Let us pray. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Alleluia. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. O God, for our redemption, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross, and by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, so that we may rise to live with Christ forever, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Please remain standing for a final hymn. 